1. Disclaimer. I do not own the rights to the material or images. This was purely made for the purpose of studying for boards. In human neurology, any discussion of the extrapyramidal system nuclei includes a consideration of numerous involuntary movement disorders. Some of these are well-defined degenerative diseases such as Huntington Chorea with caudate nuclei lesions or Parkinson's disease with substantia nigra lesions. Many of these uncontrolled spontaneous movements are poorly understood, and there is no adequate classification scheme that can be applied to veterinary medicine. In the third edition of this text, this description was included in Chapter 8, as no information is available to support that domestic animal movement disorders arise from disorders of the extrapyramidal nuclei. We have made this a separate chapter. The following is a classification of uncontrolled involuntary muscle contractions that we have developed for veterinary medicine. These are uncontrolled spontaneous contractions of voluntary skeletal muscle that occur involuntarily in the conscious patient at rest or during activity. This classification excludes contractions that are part of a seizure disorder or that occur during sleep. We are well aware that some movement disorders are difficult to differentiate from focal size years in which the patient is still conscious. Box 20-1 shows an outline of this classification. The basis for the involuntary movements resides in the muscle or the lower motor neuron, LMN. Muscle disorders of the muscle cell membrane may result in persistent repetitive muscle cell contractions without relaxation following a physiologic stimulus. This is the definition of myotonia. It represents a muscle cell membrane disorder. Inherited and acquired forms of myotonia exist. Inherited non-dystrophic myotonia The inherited forms of myotonia are often referred to as congenital myotonia, but the myotonic signs are not necessarily present at birth. They usually are first observed at a few weeks of age. Studies of the pygmy goat, miniature schnauzer dog, and merha water buffalo have determined that affected animals all have a deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA, mutation of the gene responsible for chloride channel 1 in the muscle cell membrane. This voltage-gated chloride channel 1 plays a role in the repolarization of the muscle cell membrane after contraction. When the function of this channel is deficient, muscle cell relaxation is delayed. No light microscopic lesions exist in the affected muscles of animals with inherited non-dystrophic myotonia. From a historical viewpoint, the most well-known myotonia is that which occurs in the goat. It has been recognized since the late 1800s but was not diagnosed as myotonia until the mid-20th century. The sudden onset of diffuse extensor muscle rigidity following an abrupt stimulus that often caused recumbency of the patient was incorrectly referred to as fainting disease or epilepsy. This disorder is now known to be the result of a sarcolemal chloride channel defect inherited as an autosomal dominant gene with incomplete penetrance. The clinical signs first occur at a few weeks of age and do not progress significantly. The degree of myotonia is variable. Some goats fall on their side with their limbs in extension, and others remain standing during the brief episode. Unique to this caprine disorder is that following the episode of myotonia, the affected goat completely recovers and remains refractory to another episode for about 30 minutes. Descriptions in the 1800s did not define the breeds involved but mentioned only that they were common in the central eastern states of Tennessee and Kentucky. Today, this disorder is most common in the pygmy breed. This caprine myotonia is similar to the inherited myotonia of humans known as Thompson disease. A similar myotonia has been reported in Shropshire lambs, and I have observed it in a month today lamb. Video 20-1 shows a one-year-old pygmy goat that exhibited myotonia when startled after a period of rest but was able to remain standing. Video 20-2 shows a four-month-old female Mondadale lamb with more severe myotonic episodes that caused recumbency. Note the rapid recovery. Neurologic examinations were always normal. When this lamb was one month old, the owner noted that she would walk with a stiff gait when she first got up. More recently, when she was bummed by an adult, she would fall over, with all four limbs extended, in a way that is similar to what you observe in this video. In the dog, the two most common breeds in which this inherited form of myotonia occurs are the Chow Chow and the Miniature Schnauzer. Very thorough studies by Dr. Charles Veed at the University of Pennsylvania of the Miniature Schnauzer disorder determined this to be caused by a sarcolemal chloride channel abnormality that is in her eyed as an autosomal recessive gene. The offending gene has been identified, and a polymerase chain reaction, PCR, test is currently in use to determine the carrier dogs. This is available at the University of Pennsylvania. Video 20-3 shows three six-month-old miniature schnauzer litter mates that exhibit this inherited form of myotonia. Note their hesitancy to come out of the cage, which suggests that they are aware that this will cause a myotonic episode. Also note that the clinical signs nearly resolve briefly while they move around the kennel. We thank Dr. Charles Veet for this video. Affected chow chows were first described in Australia and subsequently have been diagnosed worldwide with this disorder, but the physiologic and genomic basis remains to be determined. In both of these breeds of dogs, like the goat and sheep, the myotonia may be elicited by a sudden movement by the relaxed animal, especially if the resting animal is startled. Unlike the goats and sheep, the dogs do not fully recover between episodes, and a variable degree of stiffness persists in the gait. This is more obvious in the chow chows than in the miniature schnauzers. Video 20-4 shows Tony, a four-month-old chow chow with this inherited myotonia. Note how severe the myotonia is when he first comes out of the cage on being roused in the morning after a night's rest. A brief period of apnea may occur at this time. The clinical signs rapidly improve but never disappear as they do in the goats and sheep. His coat was clipped to show off the remarkable muscle hypertrophy that is common in this disorder. Figures 20-1 through 20-3. In some dogs, treatment with procainamide or mexilidine may provide some relief, but the clinical signs will not resolve. A similarly onset myotonia that may be in her eye has been reported in other breeds of dogs, in the domestic short hair cat, and in the horse. Cats are diffusely affected, whereas some forms of myotonia in the horse are very mild and are most obvious in the caudal thigh muscles, where dimpling is readily produced and persists. Figures 20-4 and 20-5. This focal muscle dimpling produced by tapping the surface of the body is a characteristic feature of myotonia. Myotonia also occurs in horses with inherited hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. Video 20-5 shows Riskel, a four-month-old male domestic short hair kitten that has always walked with a stiff gait and has very large muscles that can be appreciated only by handling this kitten. The diagnosis of myotonia is supported by electromyography, EMG, studies, during which you can see the characteristic myotonic discharges on the oscilloscope and hear their waxing and waning dive bummer like sounds. Serum muscle enzymes are normal in these cats. A female half-sister of this kitten had the same disorder, an autosomal recessive inheritance is suspected but not proven in the domestic short hair cat. A form of congenital myotonia that is inherited as an autosomal recessive has been observed in Brazilian merha buffalo by Dr. Alex Borges at São Paulo State University.
Canadian Jose Barboza at Pearl University, Brazil. These cattle have a similar chloride channel 1 defect in the muscle cell membrane as described for the pygmy goat and miniature schnauzer dog. They are similar to the goat in that when the myotonic episodes occur, the goats may fall but the fall is followed by complete recovery for a short period before another episode may occur. Muscle hypertrophy is remarkable as these calves grow. Video 20-6A shows three heifers with this disorder, and video 20-6B shows a similarly affected calf. Inherited dystrophic myotonia A form of myotonia, pseudomyotonia, complex repetitive discharges, may contribute to the gait abnormality observed in a number of myopathic disorders, in which paresis is the most significant clinical sign. An example of this is the dystrophinopathy that is inherited in male golden retrievers and has been seen in numerous breeds as an X-linked recessive spontaneous mutation. This disorder is described in Chapter 5 and can be seen in videos 5-17 and 5-18 which show a similar disorder occurs in male cats that are a few months of age. This causes a similar slow, stiff gait and remarkable muscle hypertrophy. In muscular dystrophy, extensive muscle cell necrosis is followed by attempts at regeneration. Therefore, the serum muscle enzymes are all significantly elevated. Myotonia may contribute to the stiffness seen in young farm animals that have a myopathy associated with dietary deficiencies of vitamin E or selenium. See case example 5-23. Acquired myotonia. Acquired myotonia is most commonly observed in older dogs with hypertonic corticoidism that may be caused by a pituitary abnormality, an adrenal cortical neoplasm, or prolonged corticosteroid administration. The myopathic disorder causes persistent characteristic gait stiffness associated with significant muscle hypertrophy. Complex repetitive discharges, or pseudomyotonia, are observed on EMG evaluation. On EMG, the complex repetitive discharges observed in this form of myotonia start and stop abruptly, without the waxing and waning that is seen in true myotonia. The pathophysiology of the muscle disorder are responsible for this is not well understood. Considering the large number of dogs that have hyperadrenic corticoidism, this clinical entity is relatively rare. If untreated, the disorder can progress to become severe enough to make the patient be unable to stand and walk. In addition, treatment of hyperadrenic corticoidism does not necessarily result in recovery from this muscle disorder. This is a good example of a gait disorder that fits the saying seeing is believing. The following videos show dogs with this myopathic disorder. All of these dogs had long histories over many months of slowly progressive gait stiffness that was diagnosed as unexplained lameness and was commonly blamed on chronic arthritis. The dogs were treated with corticosteroids. As a rule, these dogs are referred to as specialty practice without a diagnosis. In cases with naturally occurring hyperadrenic cortisism and this myopathic disorder, it is common for affected dogs to not have severe clinical signs related to cortisol excess or serum alkaline phosphatase elevations as is typical for hyperadrenic cortisism. Consequently, without clinical signs of hyperadrenic cortisism owners are not prompted to seek veterinary care, resulting in prolonged exposure to exogenous corticosteroids, which may allow this myopathy to develop. Certainly, testing for hyperadrenic cortisism should be pursued in dogs demonstrating gait characteristics as seen in the following videos. Video 20-7 shows Porky, a 9-year-old castrated male miniature poodle. Video 20-8 shows Tangy, an 8.5-year-old dachshund. Video 20-9 shows Sarah, a 13-year-old female dachshund. Video 20-10 shows Zeddy, a 12-year-old miniature poodle. Video 20-11 shows Taffy, a 7-year-old miniature poodle. At the end of this video is the EMG study. Listen to the abrupt start and stop of the complex repetitive discharges. Nervous system neuronal causes of involuntary skeletal muscle contractions involve spontaneous uncontrolled discharge of LMNs. The resulting clinical signs may be grouped into four categories. 1. Tetanus. 2. Tetany. 3. Myoclonus. And 4. Movement disorders. Tetanus. Physiologic tetanus is the clinical sign of sustained contraction of muscles without relaxation that most commonly affects extensor. Anti-gravity. Muscles. The degree of persistent extensor muscle contraction is variable among patients and is due to the disinhibition of extensor motor neurons in the spinal cord ventral gray columns. This clinical sign is most commonly caused by the neurotoxin produced by infection with the bacterium Clostridium tetany. This toxin interferes with the interneuron release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter glycine in the spinal cord ventral gray horn and gamma aminobutyric acid, GABA, in the brain stem motor nuclei. By strict definition, tetanus is a clinical sign, although the term is commonly used for the disease caused by infection by C. tetany and its production of the toxin tetanospasmin. The clinical sign of tetanus also occurs in the thoracic limbs of Australian cattle dogs that have an inherited polyencephalomyelopathy caused by degenerate shine of interneurons in the cervical intumescence. See case example 21-12. Tetanus occurs in all domestic animals and humans. Be sure that your vaccination status is current for your own protection. C. tetany produces spores that are very resistant and may persist for long periods in the environment. When spores gain entrance to an anaerobic environment in an animal's tissues, they convert to the vegetative form and produce a neurotoxin, tetanospasmin, in 4 to 8 hours. An area of tissue damage resulting from trauma or surgery is ideal for this production. The toxin gains access to motor neurons at their teledendrons at the neuromuscular junct shines and binds to the axonal ganglia sides, where it is transported to the spinal cord within a few hours. The toxin passes from the xenorenal cell bodies to the adjacent inhibitory neurons at their synaptic sites. There, the toxin binds to an enterosy interneuron, called the Renshaw cell. This toxin is a zincandopeptidase that cleaves the cell membrane protein necessary for the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter and therefore blocks the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter, glycine or GABA. The toxin usually remains bound to the interneuron for three or more weeks. In most cases the toxin spreads rapidly within the central nervous system, CNS, or the toxin may circulate through the vascular system to neuromuscular junct shines and thereby gain access to other areas of the CNS. Although this tetanospasmin may bind to other neurons, the major site is on the inhibitory interneurons that synapse on the alpha motor neurons that innervate the anti-gravity extensor muscles. The site where clinical signs first are seen usually reflects where the toxin first gained entrance to the CNS. If the infection occurred in a wound in the pelvic limb, the clinical signs will first occur in the pelvic limb, followed rapidly by signs in the opposite pelvic limb, then the trunk and thoracic limbs, and finally the neck and head. If a puppy becomes infected in a wound in its mouth, the clinical signs of tetanus will occur in the head and neck first and spread caudally from there. In most cases, the clinical signs reflect diffuse and rapid spread of the toxin in the CNS. However, occasionally the clinical signs remain localized to the area where the toxin first entered the CNS. This is called focal tetanus, which you can observe in some of the case examples that follow this brief description of the disease. Focal tetanus may reflect the natural resistance of certain species to the effects of the toxin. Usually, clinical signs occur about 5 to 10 days after wound infection. In the most severe form of the disease, the animal is recumbent, with opisthotonus and extensor rigidity in all 
of four limbs, figure 20-6, and rigid facial and masticatory muscles that prevent prehension, and mouth opening, called lock jaw, in humans, the facial expression created by the tetanic facial muscles is referred to as rhesus sardonicus, which means scornful laughter, figures 20-7 through 20-9, rarely, the CNS neuronal disinhibition causes a seizure, death occurs as the result of tetanus of the respiratory muscles, in mild diffuse tetanus, the patient remains standing, with its neck and tail extended and its ears and lips drawn back in contraction, it walks slowly, with a very stiff gait, figure 20-10, no ataxia is present because the toxin has no effect on sensory systems or the cerebellum, spasms of the extra ocular muscles that cause the eyeball to retract result in protrusion of the third eyelid. This is often the initial clinical sign observed by owners of dogs with tetanus. This is especially evident in horses, in which it can readily be elicited by a menacing gesture. Bloat may occur in cattle. All of these clinical signs are exacerbated by activity or excitement, and the rate of axonal transport is thought to be increased by neuronal activity. Although this disease occurs in all domestic animals, the horse appears to be the most susceptible and the dog and cat the least susceptible. It is commonly fatal in horses and young farm animals. Treatment should consist of rest in a quiet environment. It may also help to plug the patient's ears with cotton to avoid distractions and excitement. Say the shine of the patient may be helpful. Examine the patient carefully for the infected wound, which commonly cannot be found. In cattle, a common site of infection is through emetritis. Any external wound should be debrided, and the patient should receive antibiotics and antitoxin locally and intravenously. The antitoxin has little effect on the toxin that has already bound to the interneurons, but it should prevent further neurotoxin from entering the nervous system. Supportive nursing care is critical to keep the patient adequately nourished and to assist with the excretions. You must be patient because it may take weeks for recovery to occur. We have treated many patients with tetanus successfully with supportive care, including antibiotics, sedation, and good nursing care, and without the use of antitoxin, which may be difficult to obtain at times and may precipitate a hypersensitivity reaction. Some patients with tetanus will also require the placement of a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy tube for feeding. The following videos show examples of tetanus in various species of domestic animals. Video 20-12 shows Crystal, a three-month-old female Rottweiler that, over seven days, progressed from exhibiting an abnormally stiff facial expression to stiffness in the thoracic limbs to stiffness in the pelvic limbs to recumbency. The video was made on the ninth day of clinical signs. The portion of the video in which you see her brought out of the cage the second time was made one week after the first portion. Note the return of function in the pelvic limbs. The last portion of the video, showing Crystal outdoors, was made six days later. Note the recovery of function in all limbs but the persistence of the facial muscle signs. The progress of recovery reversed the initial progress of the clinical signs. No wound was found, but the progression of clinical signs suggests that the source of infection may have been infection of an oral cavity lesion possibly related to teething or chewing a sharp object. Younger dogs that develop tetanus are more likely to have more severe clinical signs than older dogs in our experience. In a study of 35 dogs with tetanus, the 28-day survival rate was 77%. Video 20-13 shows Trupper, an adult male mongrel farm dog, who after being missed for a few days, was found in an empty holding tank. In trying to climb out of the steel tank, he had injured all of his paws. They were treated, and about one week later he developed a stiff gait, as seen in this video. Note the absence of ataxia. Note the stiffness of the entire body. Note the involvement of the head muscles for facial expression and jaw function. He slowly improved and recovered in about three weeks. Video 20-14 shows Tags, a four-month-old spayed female Australian shepherd with four days of progressively stiff gait and no evidence of any ataxia. She recovered over the next three weeks. Video 20-15A shows Charlie, a one-year-old male Shetland sheepdog that, over 24 hours, became unable to use his left thoracic limb, and 24 hours later he lost the use of his right thoracic limb. See the owner's video and note that both thoracic limbs exhibit tetanus. This video was made four weeks after the sudden onset of these clinical signs, and no change had occurred. Video 20-15B shows Charlie and a control dog playing in the snow. This video was made six weeks after video 20-15A. The last portion of video 15B, in which Charlie is shown indoors again, was made six weeks later, and you can see that he has recovered the use of his right thoracic limb and occasionally uses his left thoracic limb. His complete recovery from this focal form of tetanus took about five months. Video 20-16 shows Scout, a six-month-old castrated male domestic short hair that rapidly developed the signs you see on this video seven days after surgery for castration. Note the tetanus confined to the pelvic limbs and trunk, which correlates with infection of the surgical wound. His clinical signs did not progress any further, and he recovered over the next two to three weeks. Video 20-17A and Video 20-17B show Gunner, an adult castrated male domestic short hair that was attacked by a dog and severely beaten in the left pelvic limb. These wounds were treated surgically and about two weeks later the owner observed an abnormal posture of the left pelvic limb. The video was made one month after the surgery. This is another example of focal tetanus related to the site of infection. Gunner recovered completely one month after this video was made, or six weeks after the clinical signs were first observed. Video 20-18 shows an adult horse exhibiting the clinic house signs of tetanus. Note the stiff gait without any ataxia, the stiff neck, elevated tail, abnormal ear posture, and third eyelid elevation, which is seen when the head was elevated. This horse died a few days after this video was made. Video 20-19 shows a one-month-old Holstein that developed a stiff gait and became recumbent over a few days. This calf died a few days later of respiratory distress and arrest. Video 20-20 shows a one-month-old lamb exhibiting the clinical signs of tetanus. Note the tail docking surgical wound, which was probably the site of infection and the source of the neurotoxin tetanospasmin. This lamb died a few days later. Tetany tetany is a clinical sign of sustained contraction of muscles, usually the extensors, which is variably intermittent and is related to varying degrees of relaxation of affected muscles. In strychnine intoxication, the toxin interferes with the release of the inhibitory neurotransmitter glycin from spinal cord interneurons, but the degree of extensor muscle contraction varies in the affected patient. This is tetany because the extensor muscle contraction decreases in the relaxed patients but may be exacerbated by any abrupt stimulation that causes a patient to move suddenly. Hypocalcemia is a common cause of tetany. An inherited congenital tetany occurs in pulled hair of fur calves. The tetany is present at birth and causes the calf to become recumbent. These calves always maintain a degree of increased extensor muscle contraction, but any stimulus induces a marked degree of extensor rigidity of the limbs and trunk. Opisthotonus is uncommon. When picked up, these calves have the appearance and feel of a wooden sawhorse. Figure 20-11. This disorder is common in Australia, where Dr. Peter Harper and his colleagues have identified a mutation in the gene responsible for the assembly of the alpha-1 subunit of the glycine receptor on spinal cord extensor 
motor neuronal cell membranes. This genetic mutation is inherited as an autosomal recessive gene. The abnormal glycine receptors are the basis for the disinhibition seen in these calves. The studies of the pathogenesis of this titanic disorder are exemplary, but unfortunately, the disorder has been labeled as inherited congenital bovine myoclonus. It is our opinion that this is an inappropriate use of the term myoclonus. See our definition later in this chapter. We believe these calves have inherited congenital tetany. Video 20-21 shows a six-week-old polled hair effort that has exhibited this inherited tetany since birth. A neurologic disorder similar to that in these polled hair effort calves occurs in related families of Labrador retrievers and has been referred to as familial reflex myoclonus. We believe the clinical sign exhibited by these affected puppies is tetany. Video 20-22 shows two affected Labrador retriever puppies of a litter of eight produced by the mating of a father and its daughter. An autosomal recessive inheritance is suspected but not proven. In addition to litters of this breed, we have observed similar clinical signs of congenital tetany in a litter of cocker spaniels and in lambs. None of these animals has any recognizable structural disorder on microscopic examination of the nervous system. Glycine receptor studies have not been performed on these dogs. A similar inherited glycine receptor abnormality is described in humans as a cause of startle disease, or hyperreplexia. In these patients, an external stimulus usually induces sudden contraction of primarily anti-gravity muscles. A presumptive inherited tetany has been published as a myoclonus in Peruvian pasos, in which a deficiency of spinal cord neuronal glycine receptor function was determined. The tetanic episodes and occasionally just myoclonus are stimulus-induced. Some of these foals are able to stand and walk. The glycine deficiency has been determined to be worse in the more severely affected recumbent animals. A form of congenital tetany occurs in newborn Egyptian Arabian foals that have a color dilution hair coat. Breeders have referred to this as lavender Arabian foal syndrome, and it is considered lethal. These foals are recumbent at birth and have a normal sensorium, but any effort to right themselves elicits severe extensor rigidity of all limbs as well as of the trunk and neck, producing opisthotonus. At times, their muscles are remarkably relaxed between episodes, but these foals are never able to stand. They act disoriented and occasionally have abnormal nystagmus. Their occasional thrashing movements mimic seizure activity. We believe that the most prominent clinical sign is episodic tetany and that this is not a seizure disorder. Electroencephalography, e.g., studies are needed to better define the clinical signs. This form of tetany is very different from that seen in the hair of fur calves and that it is only one of the clinical signs exhibited by these foals. No microscopic lesions are present in the nervous system. Genetic studies have identified a deletion in myosin VA that is responsible for the syndrome that is inherited as an autosomal recessive. Video 20-23 shows a one-day-old Arabian foal that has been recumbent since delivery. Its sensorium was normal, and it was able to suckle well. Video 20-24 shows another newborn Arabian foal with the same disorder. The veterinarian with this foal is the late Dr. Henry Finelli, a veterinary practitioner in Montana who published his experience with this disorder. The Cavalier King Charles Spaniel has an episodic neurologic disorder referred to as episodic falling, hyperdonicity, or tetany. We describe this disorder here under the clinical sign tetany but also included in the category of movement disorders. The terms tetany and dystonia of anti-gravity action sar muscles are interchangeable here. This disorder consists of episodes of tetany of the pelvic limbs and trunk or of all four limbs that may cause a patient to fall or to stand with a rigid posture that has been referred to as deer stalking. It may last from a few seconds to a few minutes, and afterwards the dog is normal in all respects. The onset of this disorder occurs at about three to four months of age. Episodes may be precipitated by stress or excitement. This disorder also has some resemblance to hyperreplexia in humans who have a glycine receptor abnormality. No histologic lesions are present in the nervous systems of these dogs. Glycine receptor studies have not been done. An inherited basis is presumed but remains to be identified. No treatment has been entirely satisfactory, but some relief has been observed with the administration of clonazepam or acetazolamide. Video 20-25 shows a four-month-old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that exhibits this disorder. Video 20-26 shows a six-month-old Pitbull Terrier exhibiting similar clinical signs. These episodes have been present since it was a young puppy. Between the episodes, this dog is entirely normal, but that is not shown on this video. Focal tetany, spastic paresis and spastic syndrome. Spastic paresis is a form of focal tetany that is presumed to be inherited and has been recognized in numerous breeds of cattle. It has been referred to as spastic paresis, or Elsa Hall. Elsa was a Scandinavian bull that was implicated many years ago in disseminating this disorder in Europe, where it is most common. The disease is uncommon in North America, although it does occur occasionally, primarily in the Holstein and Angus breeds. The inheritance is considered to be a polygenic disorder of low heritability. The tetany is limited to the tarsal extensors in the caudal crust that are innervated by the tibial nerve. One or both pelvic limbs are involved, and the onset usually occurs between a few weeks and six months of age. The earliest clinical sign is stiffness in the affected pelvic limbs when the calf is walking. The tarsus is more extended than normal, causing the appearance of a straight hawk. As the clinical signs progress, when protraction is first initiated in the affected limb, the tarsus and stifle suddenly overextend and the calf attempts to advance the limb by hip flexion, with the other joints held in extension. The stifle extension is presumed to be secondary to the tarsal extension because of the effect of the reciprocal apparatus and the role of the peroneus tertius. The signs of focal tarsal tetany disappear when the calf lies down and relaxes. The signs occur only when the limb is moved. As the disorder slowly worsens, the affected limbs may abruptly extend caudally and swing like pendulums during attempts to walk. Each time the hoof touches the ground, the limb briskly extends caudally. The clinical signs may become so severe that the calf cannot stand to walk. The disorder appears to cause the calf concitable discomfort because it becomes inactive and prefers to lie down. Subsequently, it loses weight. No gross or microscopic lesions are recognized in the tibial nerves or in their components in the spinal cord segments. Physiologic studies have implicated hyperactivity of the gamma afferent neurons that innervate the intrafusal muscle fibers in the neuromuscular spindles of the gastrocnemius muscle. Transection of the one afferent neuronal axons in the dorsal roots that are associated with the origin of the tibial nerve stop the clinical signs. Selective procaine anesthesia of the gamma afferent neuronal axons in the ventral roots associated with the origin of the tibial nerve also stops the clinical signs. The basis for the hyperactivity of these gamma afferent neurons is unknown. Therefore, this disorder is considered an idiopathic functional disorder involving the myotatic reflex mechanism for the gastrocnemius muscle. In Europe, where this disease is common in many breeds, affected calves are treated surgically to allow them to gain market weight in a period of time that is still profitable. Treat
treatment consists of either denervation of the gastrocnemius muscle in the proximal crust or transection of the gastrocnemius tendon at its attachment to the calcaneus. No affected animal or its parent should be used in breathing. Video 20-27 shows a five-month-old Holstein with the clinical signs of this focal tetany in the left pelvic limb. The signs have been slowly progressing for one month. Spastic syndrome is a somewhat similar focal tetany that affects adult cattle and that owners refer to as crampiness or stretches. It is most common in the Holstein and Guernsey breeds. The onset occurs between three and seven years of age. The clinical signs are most evident in confined cattle and are associated with attempts to stand up or a sudden movement of the standing animal after a period of relaxation. The disorder is characterized by episodes of marked caudal extension of the pelvic limbs that prevents protraction of the limbs. This tetany may also be evident in the extensor muscles of the lumbar vertebrae. Usually, these clinical signs last from a few seconds to several minutes, but occasionally, they are prolonged. The signs disappear when the animal lies down but may be aggravated by stress or excitement. They persist for the life of the animal and may slowly progress to prevent the animal from being able to stand up. In limited autopsy studies of affected animals, no gross or microscopic lesions have been found in the nervous system. It is presumed to be a functional disorder that may represent a primary disturbance of the myotatic reflex mechanism similar to the focal tetany observed in young cattle described above and referred to as spastic paresis in the literature. This adult syndrome is thought to be inherited as a single recessive factor with incomplete penetrance. Despite this knowledge, this focal tetany may be found in many older bulls that are regularly used in artificial insemination facilities. Myoclonus myoclonus is the clinical sign of a sudden contraction, followed by immediate relaxation, of a group of muscle cells. Sporadic and repetitive forms are observed. The repetitive form may be described as a tremor. Sporadic myoclonus sporadic myoclonus can be benign or a form of seizure disorder. Benign sporadic myoclonus is a sudden contraction of a group of muscles causing, for example, a limb to move suddenly or the facial muscles to twitch, but it is a single event and is not repeated in the immediate period. The cause is unknown. Sporadic myoclonus that is repeated over a period of minutes two hours may be a form of a focal seizure caused by a prosencephalic disorder that is often but not necessarily structural in origin. Idiopathic forms are less common. These patients need to be studied like those with any other seizure disorder and treated with appropriate anticonvulsants. See Chapter 18. Video 20-28 shows Teak, a 15-year-old castrated male dachshund that for two weeks exhibited sporadic myoclonus that was increasing in frequency. The owner took Teak to an ophthalmologist because she thought Teak was experiencing pain in his eyes. It was recommended that Teak be studied for a seizure disorder. The outcome of that case is unknown. Video 20-29 shows Dakota, a 12-year-old castrated male golden retriever, exhibiting sporadic myoclonus that represents a focal seizure disorder. Video 20-30 shows a stray cat that was rescued from a fire and taken to an emergency hospital for severe dyspnea. The dyspnea had been improving over two days when the neurologic signs observed on this video first occurred. These clinical signs included blindness, with normal bilateral pupil size that responded well to light, and frequent sporadic myoclonus of one thoracic limb or the entire neck and trunk. It was assumed that this sporadic myoclonus was a focal seizure due to a prosencephalic disorder resulting from the toxic effects of smoke inhalation or hypoxia but delayed for a few days. This delay is observed in humans following similar exposure to house fire smoke and varies from a few days to months. This cat recovered spontaneously over the next 7 to 10 days. Repetitive myoclonus Repetitive myoclonus may be constant during both action and rest and even during sleep, or it may be action-related and observed only when the patient is awake and contracting its muscles to maintain its posture or to move. Constant repetitive myoclonus This is a unique syndrome that we have seen only in dogs and most often in dogs that have been infected with the canine distemper virus and have developed some degree of encephalomyelitis. We have also seen this constant repeated type myoclonus in a dog with lead poisoning, the myoclonus resolved with chelation therapy. This myoclonic syndrome is usually limited to one or two limbs, occasionally the jaw, and less often the whole body. Whatever group of muscles is involved does not change in the affected dog. The muscle contractions occur rhythmically, one or a few seconds apart, and are most obvious in the resting animal. They occur during activity but are usually masked by the action involved. They continue in the recumbent resting state and commonly during sleep. It is hypothesized that this is a functional disorder in the central pattern generator environment of the LMN cell bodies innervating the myoclonic muscles and is caused by some form of pacemaker mechanism that results in the rhythmic stimulation of the participating LMNs. The myoclonus persists despite transection of the spinal cord cranial to the involved intumescence. In many affected dogs, the myoclonus can be stopped by intravenous lidocaine or oral procainamide or mexilidine. When the procainamide is stopped, the myoclonus returns. Microscopic lesions in the environment of these LMNs are very mild or absent. The role played by the distemper virus in inducing the syndrome is unknown. Usually, dogs that have a myoclonic syndrome also have other neurologic deficits caused by the destructive effects of the virus. In the older literature, repeated type myoclonus was commonly called canine chorea, which is a misnomer. In Korea, the myoclonic muscle groups continually change in the affected patient. This is described with movement disorders. Video 20-31 shows Trevor, a three-month-old male St. Bernard that began to exhibit constant repetitive myoclonus in the pelvic limbs the day after his second vaccination for canine distemper. Simultaneously, he developed difficulty walking with the pelvic limbs. In addition to the pelvic limb myoclonus, he exhibits a mild spastic paresis and ataxia in the pelvic limbs, which is characteristic of a mild spinal cord lesion between the T3 and L3 spinal cord segments. Slow hopping in the left thoracic limb implicates a mild lesion in the left side between the C1 and C5 spinal cord segments or in the left side of the caudal brain stem or the right prosencephalon. The myoclonus implicates the L4 to S1 spinal cord segments. Such a multifocal distribution of lesions is typical of an inflammatory lesion in a young dog. Canine distemper is a common cause of such an inflammation in dogs, and the presence of the myoclonus strongly supports this presumptive diagnosis. Trevor was euthanized and this diagnosis was confirmed at autopsy. Video 20-32 shows a five-year-old castrated male German Shepherd dog that had been adopted at one year of age. At that time, he was suffering from a respiratory and gastrointestinal disorder. He recovered from this illness but shortly afterward developed constant repetitive myoclonus of the masticatory muscles. Although he was examined by a number of veterinarians, no diagnosis was made. At five years of age, he was presented to the dental service at the University of Pennsylvania because of the deviation of his teeth caused by the chronic myoclonus, which was still present. He exhibited no other neurologic signs. Intravenous lidocaine stopped the myoclonus, 
and he was placed on an oral dosage of procainamide that maintained elimination of the myoconus. Video 20-33 was made of a dog in Mexico that exhibited the same kind of masticatory muscle myoconus. The video was made by Cornell students who were in Mexico to assist in a spay-neuter clinic, and this dog was one of their patients. The affected dog is being held by Dr. Catherine Goldberg, Cornell, 2004. Action-related repetitive myoconus as a rule. This form of myoconus diffusely affects skeletal muscle and is rapid, with many contractions and relaxations per second, producing what is commonly described as a tremor. The more active the patient is, therefore recruiting more LMN stimulations, the more rapid is the myoconus or tremor. It entirely disappears in the totally relaxed or sleeping patient. Action-related myoconus is sometimes referred to as intention tremors and is related to a cerebellar disorder. However, if the myoconus is caused by a cerebellar disorder, obvious signs of a cerebellar ataxia will be present, and the myoconus, or tremors, will be limited to the head and neck, a diffuse whole body. Action-related myoconus or tremor cannot be produced by a lesion that is limited to the cerebellum. In our experience, it requires a diffuse disorder that may be structural, affecting myelin or neurons, or may be functional, caused by toxicity or neurotransmitter disorder. Congenital and acquired forms of repetitive action-related myoconus have been observed. Congenital action-related repetitive myoconus. Congenital tremor. This is most commonly caused by a diffuse abnormality of CNS myelination, a lupodystrophy that includes both hippomyelination and dysmyelination. In hippomyelination, myelin is either not created or insufficiently produced while in dysmyelination the myelin is normally produced but cannot be maintained and soon degenerates. Newborn animals with hippomyelination have recognizable clinical signs of birth or when they are able to walk. Animals with dysmyelination usually show clinical signs after they are a few weeks or months of age and have exhibited normal neuromuscular activity. Importantly, hippomyelination and dysmyelination should be differentiated from demyelination. In disorders resulting in demyelination, myelin is formed and maintained normally and the animal is normal until affected by a disease process that causes a loss of myelin. In primary demyelination, the disease process is directed at the myelin sheath with sparing of the axon. In secondary demyelination, the disease process is directed at the axon and the demyelination occurs because of the loss of the integrity of the axon. It is uncommon for demyelination to result in action-related repetitive myoconus unless it is very diffuse such as integloboid cell leukodystrophy. In animals with hippomyelination, the tremors are observed at birth or as soon as the animal can stand and walk. They are related to action and are not present when the patient is resting or sleeping. These congenital myelin disorders have been studied extensively in pigs, in which viral causes, heart cholera, swine fever, circa, inherited causes, landrace, British saddleback, and toxic causes, trichlor found from 43 to 65 days of gestation, have been identified. Video 20-34 shows a newborn pig with diffuse congenital action-related repetitive myoconus, congenital tremors, caused by hippomyelination of a known cause. Note that when the pig is totally relaxed as it tries to sleep, the tremors stop. In sheep and cattle, the in utero infection by certain strains of the bovine virus diarrhea virus causes hippomyelination. In newborn lambs with border disease, congenital tremors due to hippomyelination are associated with an abnormal fleas. These are referred to as hairy shaker lambs. This is caused by a pestiviris, flaviviridae, that is closely related to the bovine virus diarrhea virus. Occasionally, affected calves and lambs grow out of the problem, presumably by eventually producing sufficient myelin to allow normal neuronal conduction to occur. Video 20-35 shows a four-day-old Holstein calf that has been unable to stand since birth and exhibits diffuse tremors whenever it exerts itself. These tremors disappear when the calf is completely relaxed. A diffuse hippomyelination was diagnosed at autopsy, and an in utero infection with a bovine virus diarrhea virus was presumed. Video 20-36 shows a three-day-old hair for a calf with a history and clinical signs identical to those of the calf in the previous video. At autopsy, this calf had microscopic evidence of a diffuse edema of the gray and white matter throughout the CNS. These are the lesions published as being congenital cerebral edema by Dr. Robert Jolly in 1974. This disorder is now referred to as congenital neuraxial edema or spongy degeneration and is caused by branched chain ketoacid decarboxylase deficiency that is inherited as an autosomal recessive gene. In children, this is known as maple syrup urin disease. This shows the value of an autopsy diagnosis and that the means of preventing more of these cases differ significantly between the two disorders. Hippomyelination causing congenital tremors in dogs has been reported in many breeds, but no viral cause has yet been identified. In some breeds, an inherited basis has been documented. This includes a sex-linked recessive gene in male spring or spaniels and an autosomal recessive gene in Samoyeds, and both these genes are lethal. However, in most descriptions, the inherited basis is presumed but not confirmed. We have observed a congenital tremor in Domitian puppies that is a coarse tremor producing a bouncing movement primarily in the pelvic limbs and trunk, from which recovery occurred in a few weeks. In this circumstance, the myelination is considered retarded. The family incident suggested an autosomal recessive inheritance. We have recently seen a similar disorder in a litter of golden retrievers. I have had the opportunity to follow three affected Vimar honor pups out of a litter of six. The signs resolved in all three pups by six months of age. While in a chow chow mix, the signs persisted through adulthood. I have also studied videos and autopsy findings from a litter of Catahoula puppies with this disorder collected by Dr. Marie Colaslo while at Louisiana State University, School of Veterinary Medicine. Six out of the nine four-week-old puppies were affected in the litter. Five of the six puppies completely recovered. One was humanely euthanized at presentation, and the histopathology was consistent with hippomyelination. This is a presumptive example of retarded myelination. At the present, no hereditary basis for this disorder has been established. A diffuse action-related myoconus has been observed in border terrier puppies that presents as a generalized coarse tremor that is more severe in the pelvic limbs. This is associated with a spongiform leukoencephalomyelopathy that predominates in the cerebellum, brainstem, and spinal cord. The excessive spongy degeneration is associated with a decrease in myelination. Pedigree analysis supports an autosomal recessive inheritance. Hippomyelinogenesis causing congenital tremors is reported in rat terrier puppies and is associated with goiter and hypothyroidism secondary to a genetic mutation. Video 20-37 shows a six-week-old female Samia that has been unable to stand since birth and exhibits a severe whole body tremor whenever she tries to move. Note that the more excited she gets, the worse the tremor is. A diffuse CNS hippomyelination was diagnosed at autopsy. She was representative of similar puppies born in six related litters over a three-year period in Peterborough, New Hampshire. An inherited abnormality was strongly suspected as the cause. Video 20-38 shows a litter of six-week-old Dalmatian puppies. At three weeks of age, five puppies exhibited a coarse tremor of the pelvic limbs and trunk, which was exacerbated by movement. By six weeks, two of these puppies had nearly recovered. Note that the clinic
clinical signs are still present in three of the puppies at six weeks of age. By a few weeks later, these three puppies had also fully recovered. Video 20-39 shows two kittens of a litter of three with these clinical signs, but no further studies were done to determine the cause of the tremors. Congenital tremors caused by hemimelinogenesis was documented in Siamese kitten littermates. Congenital action-related repetitive myoclonus tremors may accompany disturbances of neuronal function. A congenital diffuse central axonopathy has been described in quarter horse foals. It caused coarse tremors that were most pronounced in the pelvic limbs and trunk and created a bobbing, bouncing action similar to that of the Dalmatian puppies previously described. We have also observed a similar central axonopathy in coarse action-related tremor most pronounced in the pelvic limbs and newborn Holstein calves. These foals and calves need assistance to stand and walk. The tremors disappear when they are resting or recumbent. Pedigree study of the affected foals and calves suggests that these are inherited disorders. Video 20-40 shows a quarter horse foal studied at Purdue University that exhibits the tremors associated with a central axonopathy. Video 20-41 shows a two-month-old Holstein calf studied at Cornell University. The calf is representative of six of 24 calves born in one season on a farm in Pennsylvania. At autopsy, these calves exhibited a diffuse central axonopathy. Action-related myoclonus commonly accompanies other neurologic signs in animals with diffuse neuronal storage disorders. These inherited enzyme deficiencies usually do not produce neurologic signs until a few weeks of age or occasionally much later and rarely at birth. Globoid cell leukodystrophy is caused by an inherited enzyme deficiency that results in demyelination. Clinical signs of spinal cord or cerebellar dysfunction occur at a few weeks of age and progress, often including a whole body tremor. A late onset oligodendroglial dysplasia occurs in bull mastiffs, producing progressive spinal cord white matter clinical signs at a few months of age that reflect a C1 to C5 anatomic diagnosis. These dogs also develop a mild diffuse whole body tremor that distinguishes this diffuse myelin disorder from the more common focal compressive cervical spinal cord lesions. Acquired action related repetitive myoclonus. This is observed most commonly in dogs as an acute onset diffuse whole body tremor that is non progressive and usually responds within a few days to a few weeks to immunosuppressive levels of corticosteroids. Continuous alternate day therapy may be needed to prevent recurrence. Occasionally, a mild vestibular or cerebellar ataxia or other neurologic signs accompany the diffuse tremor. This disorder is most common in the small white breeds such as Maltese and West Highland White Terriers. It is the basis for the name White Shaker Syndrome. However, this disorder may occur in any breed and in a dog of any coat color. The larger dog breeds are less commonly affected in our experience. The frequent occurrence in the miniature pincher suggests that this breed is overrepresented for this disorder. Imaging studies are usually normal. Occasionally we have seen evidence of a mild meningoencephalitis on magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, cerebrospinal fluid, CSF, may be normal or contain a slight elevation of lymphocytes and protein. The few microscopic studies of the CNS show very mild non subpurative meningoencephalitis consisting of a few scattered lymphocytic paravascular cuffs in the leptum meninges, parenchyma, or choroid plexus with no associated structural parenchymal lesions. The nature of a lesion and the response to immunosuppressive therapy suggests that this is an autoimmune inflammatory disorder, possibly the involved epidopus neurotransmitter or its cell membrane receptor. There is a precedent for an autoimmune reaction to be directed against a biochemical compound. Stiff man syndrome in humans is an autoimmune disease directed against glutamic acid decarboxylase, which is an enzyme necessary for the synthesis of GABA, an inhibitory neurotransmitter. In this syndrome, progressive persistent muscle spasms occur in the pelvic limbs because of a central neuronal disinhibition. The following videos, videos 20-42 through 20-46, show examples of acquired addiction related myoclonus. All of these dogs suddenly developed diffuse whole body tremor that was most prominent when you picked them up and they struggled and tensed their muscles. You could feel their entire bodies vibrate. Occasionally, this tremor includes an ocular tremor, known as opsoclonus. This is a form of rapid pendulum nystagmus in which the excur signs of each eye are of equal speed and distance. Disorders of the vestibular system cause a jerk nystagmus in which each eye has a slow movement in one direction and a fast movement in the opposite direction. All of these dogs had normal neurologic examinations except for the diffuse tremors. All of these dogs responded to corticosteroid therapy over a period of a few days. Cyclosporin has also been used successfully in some of these patients. Video 20-42 shows Chambers, a 17-month-old female West Highland White Terrier that had these tremors for six weeks. Note the one episode of disorientation when she struggles to stand. Video 20-43 shows Misty, a one-year-old spayed female West Highland White Terrier that had diffused tremors for a few days. Video 20-44 shows Sasha, a 1.5-year-old spayed female Maltese Terrier that had a diffused tremor for a few days. Video 20-45 shows Pooh, a one-year-old spayed female miniature pincher that had diffused tremors for 10 days and experienced no change over the period. Video 20-45 46 shows a three-year-old spayed female mini tube pincher that had diffused tremors for a few hours. The most common disorder that initially resembles this autoimmune inflammation and must be differentiated from it is toxicity. Many neurotoxins initiate a diffuse whole body. Action-related tremor is the first clinical sign of intoxication. Depending on the nature of the toxin and the amount of exposure, the patient may recover or may progress to other CNS signs, including seizures, semi-coma, and coma followed by death. These toxins include metaldehyde, snail bait, pyrethrins, lead, hexachlorophene, chlorinated hydrocarbons, organophosphates, and numerous mycodox. In a common intoxication that causes an acute onset of severe diffuse tremors is the ingestion of penetromay, a mycotoxin produced by penicillium species of mold that grow on contaminated bread products and refrigerated products such as cottage cheese. In this mycodoxicosis, multiple dogs in a household may develop similar signs after ingesting the same contaminated food product. Unlike in the autoimmune disorder, often dogs with mycodoxicosis present with gastrointestinal signs such as vomiting and diarrhea. I have examined three affected dogs from a single household that ingested no moldy bread from the garbage. All three patients were treated supportively and improved over the next five to seven days. Macadamia nuts contain a tremorogenic toxin that produces diffuse whole body tremor in animals that ingest them. Video 20-47 shows a six-year-old castrated male golden retriever that had been at a camp beside a pond in the main woods with one other dog. Both dogs were found one morning shaking all over, as can be seen in one dog in the video. Both were treated with activated charcoal and general anesthesia and recovered. Toxicity was the pre-sum cause, but the toxin was not identified. We thank 
Dr. Alan Podhoff at Portland, Maine. For this video, postural repetitive myoclonus. Postural repetitive myoclonus involves muscle activity and therefore could be considered action related, but this form appears to be limited to postural muscles involved with weight support and is absent during voluntary movements. It occurs primarily in two forms. One, one affects the head and neck postural muscles of relatively young dogs, and two, the other occurs in the pelvic limbs of aged dogs. In addition, a unique and severe form of postural myoclonus is pronounced in all the postural muscles of young adult Great Dane dogs. An episodic, rapid repetitive myoclonus occurs most commonly in young adult, six months to a few years, Doberman pinchers and English bulldogs. A familial basis for this has been proposed for the Doberman pincher. It is also quite common in boxers and French bulldogs and sporadic in Labrador retrievers, beagles, and mixed breeds. This myoclonus is a disorder of the relaxed patient and is unassociated with anxiety or stress. It involves primarily the neck muscles and causes a rapid tremor of the head and neck. The movement may be vertical or horizontal and appears to be present only when the head and neck are in a supporting position. It disappears when the dog is distracted by a toy or food, during eating, during any intentional activity, and when the dog lies down so that the head and neck are resting on a supporting surface. The tremor appears to depend on a specific degree of muscle tension in the neck before it occurs, suggesting that it involves some physiologic disturbance of the stretch reflex mechanism. Neuromuscular spindles are abundant in the neck muscles. This disorder is not progressive and is not associated with the development of any other neurologic signs. For unknown reasons, these tremors commonly occur sporadically for one to several weeks and then stop for a few weeks or months before occurring. We have not recognized any pattern in their occurrence. CSF and imaging studies of the head and neck are normal. When faced with a classical example of this disorder, it is reasonable to discourage CSF and imaging studies given the cost of these procedures and the likelihood that they will be normal. No reports of electrodiagnostic testing, muscle or nerve biopsies, or CNS microscopic study have been published. No studies have been done on the possible inheritance of this disorder. It may occur in any breed and in mixed breeds but certainly predominates in the breeds mentioned earlier, in which the term head bobbers is commonly used to describe the condition. This tremor syndrome may have some similarity to benign postural tremors in humans, which are referred to as essential tremors. The cause of this human disorder is poorly understood, but an abnormality of the stretch reflex mechanism has been invoked. No well-designed results of therapeutic drug studies have been published on the canine disorder. However, anticonvulsants, including phenobarbital, potassium bromide, zanisamide, gabapentin, and levodiracetam are, not surprisingly, ineffective in treating patients. In our experience, the use of these medical shines should therefore be discouraged in this disorder. The following videos show examples of this disorder. Video 20-48 shows Zach, a three-year-old castrated male Doberman pincher. Note how the tremors stop when he rests his head and neck on the blanket. Video 20-49 shows Tiffany, a 2.5-year-old female English bulldog with a history of two periods of head and neck tremors two months apart. Video 20-50 shows Rocky, a 15-month-old male English bulldog. Note that when he picks up the toy, the head and neck tremors stop. Video 20-51 shows an adult spayed female beagle. This is testimony that myoclonus occurs in the relaxed patient. In older dogs, a benign, rapid, postural, repetitive myoclonus, tremor occasionally develops in the pelvic limbs. Rarely are all four limbs affected. This tremor is evident only in the relaxed standing dog and disappears or is completely masked during voluntary movement and disappears in the recumbent dog that is, thus, not supporting weight. This postural myoclonus can be elicited in a dog that is resting in lateral recumbency by applying pressure to the plantar surface of the paw, like the head bobbers described earlier. This tremor appears to require a certain degree of tension in the limb muscles, suggesting a role of the stretch reflex mechanism in this disorder. No physiologic or pathologic studies have been published on this disorder. Although the intensity of the tremor may progress slightly with age, no indication that it causes any discomfort is present, and it does not interfere with the dog's function and thus does not require any therapy. The following videos show this postural form of myoclonus. Video 20-52 shows Bumper, a 9.5-year-old Malamute crossbreed. Video 20-53 shows Candide, a 13-year-old spayed female miniature schnauzer. Note how this low, steady pressure on the plantar surface of the paw elicits the tremor, an orthostatic postural repetitive myoclonus. Tremor occurs in young adult Great Dane dogs. It is observed only when the dog stands at rest or when it is attempting to lie down or posture for drinking, eating, or excretion. It becomes severe during efforts to lie down, causing this effort to be prolonged, during which the dog constantly moves and shifts its weight between its limbs. Once the dog is recumbent, it relaxes, and the tremor disappears. No evidence of any tremor is seen when the dog is walking or running, and the affected dog does not become fatigued. The tremor immediately disappears when the standing dog is picked up and, thus, is not supporting any weight. The neurologic examination is normal, as are all the imaging studies, CSF evaluations, and muscle and nerve biopsies. Surface EMG recordings in the awake standing animal show a constant frequency of 13 to 16 hertz, hertz, that disappears when the dog lies down. By applying a stethoscope to the muscle, you can auscultate the tremors emanating from the muscle. This is the basis for the diagnosis of orthostatic postural tremor in humans, which is described as possibly a functional CNS disorder involving a supraspinal genera. Tower, it is possible that a unique disorder of the spinal cord stretch reflex mechanism is as valid a consideration. This probably reflects our bias as clinicians and not as neurophysiologists. On the basis of limited observation of these affected dogs, the tremors have been observed to slowly increase in intensity with time. An inheritance basis is suspected in the Great Dane breed. Drug therapy studies are limited and have been inconclusive to date. Phenobarbital and gabapentin may give some temporary relief. Video 20-54 shows Dino, a 22-month-old castrated male Great Dane with a history of six months of slowly progressive trembling. It was first noticed in the thoracic limbs when he was eating and then spread to involve the pelvic limbs, especially when posturing to urinate. Note that the tremors are present only when he tries to lie down. Once his recumbent, the tremors cease, and he is completely relaxed. He can stand up normally and trot off with no clinical signs, and exercise does not fatigue him. Episodic non-postural repetitive myoclonus Episodic non-postural repetitive myoclonus is a rare observer shine in dogs that may also be classified as a form of movement disorder. This is a poorly understood event that has generated
generated numerous terms, the most common of which is myokimia. Myokimia, chyma, meaning wave, is defined as continuous undulating vermiform movements of the overlying skin caused by contraction of small bands of cutaneous muscle fibers. In addition, many patients exhibit repetitive contraction of skeletal muscle fibers resulting in persistent contraction of skeletal muscles that may be local within a limb or diffuse, affecting all four limbs. With the latter, the stiffness of the limbs may be followed by falling into lateral recumbency with rigidly extended limbs and delayed muscle relaxation. This involvement of skeletal muscle fibers is referred to as neuromyotonia. Both myokimia and neuromyotonia represent hyperexcitable general somatic efferent axons to the involved muscles. On EMG study, the individual motor unit potentials are seen to fire at a rate of 5 to 150 hertz. The underlying axonal disorder responsible for myokimia and neuromyotonia is poorly understood. When the latter occurs the stiffness of the limbs is followed by falling into lateral recumbency, with rigidly extended limbs and delayed muscle relaxation. Hyperthermia is commonly observed. In these dogs, the events are stimulated by exercise or excitement, and the episodes may last from a few minutes to a few hours, between which the dog is normal. In extreme cases, dogs may die from the hyperthermia. The severity of the muscle contractions is reflected in an elevation of the serum enzymes creating kinase, CK, aspartate aminotransferase, AST, and halonine aminotransferase. Alt, muscle hypertrophy may result in severe chronic cases. In human medicine, continuous muscle fiber activity is a term that is applied to a group of hereditary and acquired conditions of nerve origin. Continuous muscle fiber activity is considered to represent hyperactivity of nerve axons and is not usually associated with any recognizable neuropathy. An axonal voltage-gated ion channel defect may be responsible because many human patients with myokimia have circulating antibodies to voltage-gated potassium channels in the nerve axons. Potassium channels normally function to stabilize the membrane potential and regulate repetitive firing of axons. This disorder is most common in the Jack Russell Terrier, and the majority of these patients also has the clinical signs and lesions of hereditary ataxia. This suggests a related inherited basis may exist for these two disorders in this breed. Hyperthermic dogs should be immersed in cold water to lower their temperature. Treatment for the axonal channelopathy is limited. Procainamide and mexilidine are reasonable choices. I have had the opportunity to evaluate a chihuahua in a donkey, in which a clinical diagnosis of myokimia was made through observation of the muscle movements. In the donkey, needle EMG disclosed myokimite discharges, and the animal responded to phenytoin therapy. This drug is metabolized too rapidly to be useful in dogs. We have also studied a mixed breed dog that developed presumptive myokimia secondary radiation therapy over the caudal thigh muscles after treating for a mast cell tumor. See video 20 55. The signs started approximately one year after treatment with radiation therapy and have persisted over the lifespan of the dog. Myokimia secondary radiation therapy has previously been reported in humans. The pathogenesis for the radiation therapy induced myokimia in humans is thought to be associated with a persistent conduction block caused by late onset demyelination secondary to the radiation therapy. Recently, we have observed another focal myokimia following radiation therapy after removal of an infiltrative lipoma in the caudal thigh muscles in the vicinity of the sciatic nerve. See video 20 56 of the proximal thigh area of the right pelvic limb of a five year old castrated male Maltese terrier where an infiltrative lipoma was removed 15 months prior to the Raconi shine of the myokimia. The patient then received radiation therapy three months after surgery. The myokimia was first observed about 12 months after the radiation therapy. In humans, cramps and pain have been reported along with the myokimia as a late onset side effect after radiation. This was also seen in this dog. See video 20 57 for an episode of these cramps that were quite debilitating. Shivers is primarily an equine disorder that is most common in the draft horse breeds, especially those that are used regularly for strenuous work. It may occur at an age and affects primarily the muscles of the pelvic region, pelvic limbs, and tail. The clinical signs consist of repetitive myoclonic twitches or quivering of the gluteal and tail muscles, especially when the horse is made to move backward. The tail may exhibit extensor muscle myoclonic jerks. When the horse stands at rest, the clinical signs usually resolve but recur when backed up again. Occasionally, when backed up, the affected horse overflexes a pelvic limb and holds it in that position for a few seconds. The clinical signs may remain unchanged for a long period or may progress slowly. The cause of this disorder is unknown. The few microscopic studies of the nervous system of affected horses have disclosed no recognizable microscopic lesions. Some of these horses have had muscle lesions caused by polysaccharide storage disease, but the role of this muscle disease in causing shivers is unknown and its significance is a subject of considerable debate by those investigating the disorder. No useful ancillary diagnostic procedure is available. A muscle biopsy should be done to determine whether the horse has polysaccharide storage disease because that may be helped by dietary treatment. No specific treatment is available for shivers. Inheritance is suspected to be involved in the pathogenesis of this disorder, but the genetic pattern is unknown. It is best to avoid breeding affected horses or their parents. With the limited information that we have on this disorder, it is difficult to know where to place it in the classification of uncontrolled voluntary movements. We have decided to consider it a form of episodic repetitive myoclonus until further studies suggest otherwise. Video 20-58 shows Jerry, a 14-year-old Belgian horse with this episodic repetitive myoclonus called shivers. It had been present for several months. Note the quivering tail. The gluteal myoclonus is difficult to see in the video. Note the occasional overflexion of the pelvic limbs and less often of the right thoracic limb. It is important to do a complete orthopedic examination to identify any cause of discomfort in affected horses. Polysaccharide storage disease was diagnosed in Jerry on the basis of a biopsy of the biceps femoris muscle. Autopsy showed no microscopic lesions in any of the peripheral or central components of the nervous system. Resting myoclonus A myoclonus present only during rest, similar to that seen in humans with degeneration of the substantia nigra and Parkinson disease, has not been recognized in domestic animals. Horses that ingest the toxin present in yellow star thistle develop acute degeneration of the substantia nigra and globus pallidus but do not exhibit a resting tremor. No resting tremor occurs as part of the clinical syndrome seen in carry blue terriers and Chinese crested dogs, with their cerebellar cortical abiotrophy and degeneration of the substantia nigra and caudate and olivary nuclei. Movement disorder Movement disorder is defined as an episodic sudden involuntary contraction of a group of skeletal muscles in a conscious patient with a normal sensorium during rest or activity. Various terms have been used in human medicine for the varying forms of these paroxysmal movements. Chorea is an abrupt, non-sustained contraction of differ, and groups of muscles in the same patient. Dystonia is a sustained involuntary contraction of a group of muscles. Tetany is a sustained contraction of extensor muscles that is variably intermittent. Apoptosis is a prolonged contraction of trunk muscles causing a bending or writhing motion. Bellism is an abrupt contraction of limb muscles causing a flailing movement of the limb. In humans, the pathogenesis of many of these movement disorders is unknown. Some well
well defined movement disorders are related to disease of specific extrapyramidal nuclei, such as the caudate nuclei in Huntington Chorea and the resting myoclonus that occurs with the substantia nigra lesions in Parkinson's disease. Others are unassociated with any recognizable CNS lesion but are thought to be related to a dysfunction in the normal circuitry among the motor cortex, the cerebral extrapyramidal nuclei, the thalamus, and the motor cortex. The dysfunction is commonly considered to represent some disorder of neuron ion channels and is referred to as an ion channelopathy. We propose that the pathophysiology of the movement disorders we observe in domestic animals involves a disorder of the central pattern generator where the LMN is located that is responsible for the uncontrolled movement. In veterinary medicine, movement disorders have been described in a number of dog breeds. Often, the clinical diagnosis is made through pattern recognition or knowledge that such a movement disorder exists in a particular breed. In other instances, a presumptive diagnosis is established through a commonality of the clinical signs observed in the patient being examined with those reported in another breed. Having the owner videotape the animal demonstrating the movement certainly helps in evaluating patients. Given the episodic nature of some of the disorders, likewise, we encourage students and clinicians to take advantage of the video collection on the companion website as a resource for evaluating affected animals. For many years, an episodic disorder of muscle contraction has been recognized in Scottish Terriers and has been called Scotty Cramp. See video 20-59 and video 20-60. It is our opinion that this is a movement disorder. These involuntary movements usually require a degree of exercise or stress before they occur. They consist of a combination of chorea and dystonia in one or more limbs in the same dog. These muscle contractions may be severe enough to cause a dog to fall. No microscopic lesions have been found in the nervous system of these affected dogs. A deficiency of serotonin activity in the spinal cord gray matter has been implicated in the pathogenesis of this movement disorder. In patients with infrequent clinical episodes, methasergide may be of diagnostic help as it will increase the frequency and severity of the episodes. Methasergide is an inhibitor of serotonin activity. The disorder is presumed to be inherited as an autosomal recessive gene. Other movement disorders that may be familial have been recognized in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, Tedony, Hyperdonicity, Deer Stalking, the Bitchin Frise, the Soft Coated Wheaton Terrier, Personal Observation, the Norwich Terrier, and the Border Terrier, Canine Epileptoid Cramping, Spikes Disease. A classic, severe form of movement disorder was described in two unrelated litters of boxers, in which movements were defined as paroxysmal dystonic cariathetosis. See video 20 66. MRI was normal in these boxers. We have seen what we believe are forms of movement disorders in individual dogs of numerous breeds. In some instances, when the involuntary movement is repeated in the same group of muscles, it may be difficult to differentiate a movement disorder from a focal seizure disorder. This is particularly true for the Chinook seizures. Personal communication. D. O'Brien, University of Missouri. If imaging studies and CSF evaluation are normal, an EEG study, where reliably available or an anticonvulsant drug trial may be necessary to help differentiate between a movement disorder and a focal seizure. It is our opinion that when the diagnosis of movement disorder is suspected, MRI imaging is warranted to determine the possible presence of extrapyramidal nuclear lesions. We are not aware that any study of such a relationship has been published to date. A neurotransmitter ion channel disorder would not be visible on MR images. In this day of rapid advances in the genetic analysis of potentially inherited disorders, our understanding of these various movement disorders will certainly improve. A good example of this is the movement disorder that has been recognized for many years in the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel and is often referred to as episodic falling syndrome or deer stalking. This is a paroxysmal form of tetany that may be triggered by exercise, excitement, or stress. The movement is characterized by a sudden onset of rapidly progressing tetany of the thoracic and pelvic limbs that makes the patient appear as if it was stalking a deer. This is often followed by collapse with all four limbs rigidly extended. The affected dog may remain recumbent for a number of minutes before slowly making a full recovery. The dog's normal sensorium is never lost. Considerable variation exists in the degree of tetany that occurs in affected dogs. The onset of the disorder varies, usually appearing at three to four months of age. Pedigree analysis has supported this disorder as being inherited as an autosomal recessive gene. A recent DNA analysis of affected dogs discovered that a BCAN microtal shine was associated with this disorder. BCAN encodes the brain-specific extracellular matrix proteoglycan brevican. Brevican plays an essential role in the formation of paraneuronal nets that govern synapse stability and nerve conduction velocity. Carrier status in animals can now be determined, which provides breeders the ability to decrease the incidence of this disorder. Many affected dogs respond to treatment with either clonazepam or acetosolamide. A movement disorder also occurs in the border terrier and has been referred to as canine epileptoid cramping or spikes disease. To the best of our present knowledge, this is not an epileptoid, seizure, event, and the use of eponyms does not contribute to our understanding of the disorder. The following observations were made by Dr. Laurent Garossi based on a review of 29 border terriers with this movement disorder. The episode consists of a persistent hyperdonicity dystonia of the flexor and extensor muscles of one or more limbs, various axial muscles, or both, which interferes with the gait or results in recumbency and the inability to stand. During these episodes, the patient's sensorium is normal. Most episodes last from 2 to 30 minutes, but the range in these dogs was 30 seconds to 2.5 hours. Episodes often occur in clusters over a few days followed by an episode-free period of a few weeks to months. The age of onset varies from 10 weeks to 7 years but must begin before 3 years of age. No common precipitating factor for these episodes exists in this breed. A thought-provoking observation was that some dogs exhibited vomiting or diarrhea prior to or during the episode and borborygmus was auscultated in a few affected dogs. To further enhance the role of the digestive system, some owners noted a decrease in the frequency of episodes when the diet of the affected dog was changed. It was also noted that feeding a gluten-free diet decreased the incidence in some affected dogs and that in some of these dogs, an episode occurred when a diet that contained gluten was fed. This relationship between the movement disorder and the diet needs further study. It should be noted that no response to anticonvulsant therapy has occurred in these affected dogs. The following videos show various examples of these movement disorders. Video 20-59 shows Shamus, a young adult male Scott Dish Terrier that is seen going for a walk after playing in the yard for about 10 minutes. He was normal during the time. Video 20-60 shows Fergus, a castrated male Scottish Terrier. His movement disorder began at 6 months of age, and the video shows him at 3M6 years of age with no significant change in the disorder, which is intermittent. Video 20-61 shows the 4-month-old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that was described in the discussion of tetany as a clinical sign. His episodic tetany or extensor muscle dystonia is a form of movement disorder. Video 20-62 shows TJ, a 6-year-old Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that had been exhibiting an episodic head tilt with cervical torticollis that occasionally caused him to fall and roll in the direction of the torticollis. Note on the video the sudden change in direction of the head tilt or torticollis. Imaging was recommended for this dog to ascertain
ascertain absence of syringoidomy iliodor, given the head tilt and torticollis, syringobulbia, a fluid-filled cavity in the brainstem, which this breed is at risk for developing secondary to an occipital bone malformation. This study was unfortunately not performed. Video 20-63 shows Holly, a 10-year-old spayed female bitch in Frise that excelled as a pet therapy dog in her neighborhood. Note the dystonic area affecting multiple limbs in a varying pattern. These events had been occurring for two years with unpredictable frequency. Video 20-64 shows Shaggy, a two-year-old castrated male soft-coated Wheaton Terrier. The episodic movement disorder seen on the video had been occurring for the past four months with increasing frequency. Video 20-65 shows a five-month-old castrated male German Shepherd dog with a recent onset of the dystonic area form movement seen on the video. Note the haphazard multiple limb involvement. With this disorder, a fall into water may be life-threatening. Video 20-66 shows a group of five and nine-month-old boxer dogs from two unrelated litters exhibiting profound examples of severe movement disorder. The onset occurred between nine and sixteen weeks of age, and the frequency varied significantly among individual animals, from three to ten times a day to one to two times a month. Their movements were described as paroxysmal dystonic choreoapatosis. We thank DRK Ramsey of the University of Cambridge for providing us with this video. It is obvious that it is difficult to classify all of these uncontrolled involuntary movements into specific entities. We have tried to provide some order where we believe considerable lack of understanding exists.